صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم 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 الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي خلق الارض والسماء فانزل من السماء مما ان فاحيا به الارض بعد موتها هو الذي خلق الجن والانس فلهما خلق الموت والحياه ليبلوهم ايهم احسن عملا فارسل بينهم رسلا والانبياء ليهديهم صراطا مستقيما وخاصه خاصه من على المؤمنين اذ بعث فيهم رسولا فنحمده حمدا كثيرا ونشكره شكرا عظيما طيبا مباركا نصلي ونسلم على شمس الضحى بدر الدجى صدر العلا نور الهدى حبيب رب الارض والسماء الذي كان نبيا وادم كان بين التين والماء جد الحسن والحسين مولانا ومولى الثقلين بالقاسم محمد بن عبد الله نور من نور الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ماي موست اونوربل قبله مفتي صاحب Mulna sahab, Hafiz sahab, my fellow brothers, my elders, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You know, as I, <coughs> as I begin, I think first, first and foremost, I, I, I think I'm very grateful for the, for the welcome that Qibla Mufti sahab has given me. Although I myself wouldn't describe uh, my, myself as an alim, right? This is the truth. Uh, and, and the reason, uh, he, what it is, we, we continue to be students, but Alhamdulillah, Allah Ta'ala has graced us with the honor of sitting at the feet of ulama. This is it. Nothing more than this. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that a believer is a mirror. And if you sit for long enough, and this is, it goes back to exactly what... Uh, Brother Nizam was saying just before me, it's a matter of suhba really. If you, as, as a believer, since you are a mirror, if you sit in front of the scholars long enough, you start reflecting their image. And, and this is all we are, and we're, we're a reflection of scholars, and, and we're not scholars ourselves, we're, we're just people who have sat in their company, alhamdulillah. May Allah Ta'ala continue to give us the tawfiq, and the benefit of, of sitting at the feet of ulama. You know, really, suhba, is a, a, before I go to the main part of, uh, of, of my talk, suhba is incredibly important. No matter what you do in life, whatever you choose to do in life, keep suhba with the ulama. Right? The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, he said, be a scholar or be a student or be somebody who loves the scholars or listens to the scholars, but don't be the fifth for you will be destroyed. Right? So never ever move away from the scholars. Keeping company with the scholars is incredibly important. Uh, we know simply, very simply, from the maqam of Sayyidina Thawban, Mawla Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sayyidina Thawban was a, f- a freed slave of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was somebody who, while serving the Prophet ﷺ, was always with him. And he loved that. He loved the idea that he was always around the Prophet ﷺ, tending to his every need. Whatever the Prophet ﷺ would require, Thawban would be there, Ya Rasulullah, I'm here, whatever you would like, whatever, just ask me. Then when the Prophet ﷺ frees him, he, he moves away, he <coughs> continues with his life. <coughs> He comes back to the Prophet ﷺ one day <clears throat> and the Prophet ﷺ sees him and he's looking pale and he's looking anxious and he's looking very worried. 
And so the Prophet والسلام, asked him, Ma laka ya Thawban? Oh Thawban, what's wrong with you? What's the matter? You, you look really upset. You look very unwell. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, ma bi maradun wala waj'i. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm not sick in any way, if that's what you're thinking. Nor, nor am I feeling any pains in my body. It's not, 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 not like that. But Ya Rasulullah, I've been thinking to myself today that Thawban, you can't spend one day away from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is how you become. What's going to happen to you on the day of judgment? When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will go into paradise and he will be amongst those who hold the greatest maqam in paradise. And you Thawban, you don't even know whether or not you're even going to get into paradise. Right? And, and even if you do manage to get into paradise, you, have, you will be in one position, one status. He Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be in another position, in another status. So you will never ever get to meet. And you know that thought has been going around in my mind all day. And I've been thinking, Ya Rasulullah, what's going to become of me? What's going to become of me? What's going to become of me? And when he says this to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam adopts silence until Allah Almighty reveals the verse, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, وَمَن يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّيقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا Whosoever is obedient to Allah Almighty نَارَيَ تَكْبِيرِ نَارَيَ رِسَالَةِ عُلَمَاءِ أَهْلِ السُنَّةِ Whosoever is obedient to Allah Almighty and whosoever is obedient to the Prophet, to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then he will be with, with those people that Allah Almighty has bestowed a favor upon. Whether they be prophets, whether they be the righteous, whether they be martyrs. And Allah Almighty says, what beautiful companionship that will be for you in the hereafter. So it's absolutely crucial, you know, after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away from this deen, from, from, this, from this dunya, when the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam leaves, leaves us and, and veils himself from us in this world, then he leaves behind for you somebody that continues his way and that's the ulama, right? That is the ulama because he said that the ulama are the inheritors of the anbiya. And then this, is, this is what it is, that the traditions live on through the scholars. And this is why it's absolutely essential that you keep good company with, with the scholars whenever and wherever it is possible for you. We are part of a, a deen which is a very holistic deen. We are part of a ummah. And an ummah is a civilization. We're not just a nation. We, don't, we, we do not have any geographic borders we are not limited to one uh, particular group or one particular skin color or one particular language we're not a nation we are a civilization and in a civilization which is founded all civilizations were always founded on texts and and the texts that our civilization is is founded on on of course you all know is 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 the beautiful quran is it's the the word of allah almighty we are unlike the Jews and unlike the Christians and unlike the other religions that, that dictate to you what you must do in temples, that dictate to you what you should do in places of worship, but are, are limited and res restricted to that. We are part of a beautiful religion that shows you how to live your life. How to live your life inside the masjid and how to live your life when you leave the masjid. Right? And, and this is, uh, you know, when we keep saying, uh, we, we often say, uh, we, we often hear this narration, Talabul ilmi faridatun ala kulli Muslim, that seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every single Muslim. But we don't really fully understand and comprehend. We all know this means seeking of knowledge is an obligation upon 
every single Muslim. But what does this really mean for you? This means that if, if you run restaurants and takeaways, then you are obliged to learn the laws of hygiene. Right? This, this really, you, you shouldn't need the councils to come to you and, and tell you, well, no, you need, you need hygiene training. No, as a Muslim, it's fard for you to say, I want hygiene training. Right? Because this is, this is my knowledge which is far. Somebody in, um, uh, after the time of Imam Al-Marghinani, who is the, the writer of uh, Hidayah Sharif, which is a, a text which we still use today. Right? W one of his students um, said to, to one of the, the sheikhs in his time, he said, you're a great Sufi, why do you not write a text on Tasawwuf? And he said, but I've written a text on Tasawwuf. He said, no, you haven't written a text on Tasawwuf. He said, yes, I have written a text on Tasawwuf. And he said, no, show me. And he pulled out his book and he said, read this. And, and his book was entitled, uh, The Laws of Sales and Transactions. He said, this is it. Because me, my job, I'm a trader. Right? And for me, my Tasawwuf lies in this. Right? This is, this is what, what the, the fard knowledge is. And this is something we forget. So if you, if you drive a, a, a taxi, you should know the, the laws of carriage in this country. You should. Don't rely on others. Don't be forced to uh, come to, to, to learn these things. But you are obliged as a Muslim to do these things. Because as Muslims, we do the very best. Right? This is, this is very much, very much a part of our, our deen. This is very much a part of our religion that wherever we go, we seek the appropriate knowledge. One of the biggest mistakes that was made and that we allowed to happen was when people started to dictate to us that there is a secular knowledge and there is a religious knowledge. And all those people who are engaged in religious knowledge need not know about sciences. Ah, if you want to become a scholar, you study the Quran, you study hadith, you study the uloom of tafsir and usul. This is your job. As for astronomy, you leave it. As for mathematics, you leave it. As for uh, medicine, you leave it. By Allah, that's not what the Prophet ﷺ brought us, right? You know, the, he didn't. He came and he joined all of these. He merged all of these knowledges together. And the, the Quran, it united all of these knowledges. So when we talk about Islam and, and science, it's not too independent subjects, one the subject of Islam, the other the subject of, of science. No, it's nothing like that. You know, there is science within Islam and there is Islam within the science that you study. If, you see, with, with science, right, you know, here's, here's the, 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 the difficult part. Science can be good and science can be really bad. If you use science in the right way, it draws you closer to Allah Almighty. And if you use science uh, in the wrong way, you can end up destroying yourselves. After all, science is what gives us medicines which allow us to cure ourselves. And at the same time, it's the same science that gives us the nuclear bomb. And, and so it's the same knowledge. It's, it's about what it's being mated with. You see, if that science is mated with, with pure secularism, if, if science... Is, is mated with people who only want this dunya, whose only pursuit is to, to rule over the world, then, then you're going to end up with a science which is disastrous. We, we the Muslims, have, have something really incredibly beautiful. We have a, a science which is very closely related to everything that we do in our lives. And it's actually our very existence. When we talk about the verses of the Qur'an, <clears throat> you see the Qur'an isn't, it isn't a book of science. And it, it, it's, it never presented itself as a book of science. It, it is a book which contains haqa'iq, and this is what it is. It, it contains core realities. And I'll tell you, these core realities are still being discovered by the people today, in, in the name of science. And, and times are changing, views are changing. But all in the name of science, people are reaching closer and closer to what are core realities which were mentioned 1400 years ago. 
when we uh, are obedient to the verses of the Quran and we pursue science, when we are obedient to the verses of the Quran and we pursue astronomy, when we are obedient to the verses of the Quran and we pursue mathematics, we as Muslims can achieve really great things. And, and uh, I, actually, I, I often say to, to my students, all of them, that where Allah Almighty talks about innama uh, Allah min ibadihi ulama that only the ulama out of the people really fear Allah Almighty then it's not just about the ulama who understand the deen it's a, you know the verses before that talk about the mountains being of different hues and different colors it talks about fruits being in different hues and different colors it talks about humans being in different hues and different colors so actually it, it, it's the it, it's the geographer who is the alim right and it's the anatomist who is the alim Right? This, is, this is who we're talking about. It's the botanist who is the alim. Right? This, this is the alims who genuinely can get close to Allah Almighty. If, if we didn't allow uh, the, the sciences to be, if we didn't allow our, ourselves actually to be deprived. Because we're not part of, you know, what we're not a part of. We're not a part of a, a group that believes in, uh, in magic. We're not... Uh, uh, a group that believes in things like luck right so we, we don't you know if you break a mirror it's, there's no bad luck you walk under a ladder there's no bad luck right we, we don't we don't believe in these luck they, they say actually that there was a there was a hospital somewhere where at is, is exactly 11 o'clock every single day in intensive care somebody would die almost every other day somebody would die in one particular bed and they were, they were very worried about this and there were a lot of superstitious theories about what was happening uh, with that because everybody who seems to, no matter what illness they came in with originally, they, whoever landed on that bed ended up dying eventually. And, so, and it always seemed to occur at 11 o'clock. So there was these theories about, well, you know, something happens and something. So one day all of the doctors and everybody waited with all their superstitious theories about what was going to happen. And when they waited there, they realized... Uh, Mr. Singh the cleaner comes in and every day at 11 o'clock he unplugs the intensive care machines to plug in his hoover <laughs> so that he can do the vacuuming. <laughs> right. we, 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 you know, by Allah, we don't believe in luck. Right? It's, you, you don't die because you were sleeping on a particular bed. You, you die because it was your time. Right? Everything has its appointed time. Every single person, every single thing has an appointed time. So nothing is, is any further, nothing is any closer than that appointed moment. But I want to share with you something of that which is mentioned within the Qur'an. And I just, just, uh, these are things, some of them which you, you'll, you'll be familiar with. If you're not, you ought to be familiar with. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Allah Almighty says in the Qur'an, وَلَكَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ سُلَالَةٍ مِنْ تِينَ Allah Almighty says, and we have certainly created man from an extract of clay. And then we make him a nutfa, we make him a very, very small seed, we make him a very small drop, we place him in a very strong, very firm, yet very caring place. Right? We're talking about the development, early development of the fetus. Then Allah Almighty says, then we create the nutfa into an alaqa. We turn the nutfa, what was a, a small droplet of semen, it becomes an alaqa. And you know the word alaqa in Arabic has, has various meanings. The word alaqa, one of the meanings is that it's a, a, it's a clot. So it's, it's like a clot of blood and this is, we, we often say that the word alaq and the word alaqa is, is just a clot of blood. One of the meanings of the word alaqa is from, we, we often again use this in Arabic, alaqa yu'alliku ta'aliq, it means to hang or suspend something. Uh, one of the meanings of, of alaqa is the word leech. And so if you look at the Qur'an, 1400 years ago, in Revelation, when the Qur'an is addressing the development of the fetus, 
Allah Almighty is talking about the, the fetus in its earliest development and he describes it as an alaqa. Could you describe it as a clot of blood? Yes. Yes. There could be perhaps no, no better description than a clot of blood. Why? Because this is the first time that you have the tiniest heart developing. Right? And that red heart, it, it's there and it, it doesn't start beating yet at this stage. But it's this incredible, incredibly small dot. But this dot actually develops. That this is one thing. Could you at this stage de describe it as a thing which has been suspended? Yes, it is. Because when the, the fetus is at this stage, the alaka is, is a very small uh, piece uh, of... of uh, it's a very small clot of blood which is suspended by what will later go on to become the umbilical cord. But just at this point, there's a very small stiff piece that just holds it perfectly in place. And, and even the, the doctors say, you might say that it's almost suspended where it is. Almost exactly as Allah Almighty said it. And then the word alaka, it also means leech. And so if you compared the development of a fetus at this stage to a, an image of a leech, you will find almost exactly the same size. You will find exactly the same layout between the two. And so this is not... This is a science. This is a science which exists within the, the, the verse of, of, of the Qur'an. So, you know, the, the, this, it's not a by chance word. You know, the word alaqa, it is not by chance. It is picked by Allah Almighty. And I've often, often said, you can't translate the Qur'an for this reason. Right? Because the Qur'an comes from somebody who is a supreme being, who is beyond your comprehension. There is nothing like him. And so be, since he is beyond anything that you could possibly comprehend, and, and since the revelation is from him, it's an incredible revelation. Right? And so, you know, every single letter of the Qur'an, every single vowel of the Qur'an has its place for a particular reason. Why the kha is pronounced the way it is, why the ayn is pronounced the way it is, why the ha is pronounced the way it is. All of these things, why? They all have a perfect place. They, there is, whether it's to create the perfect rhythm to soothe your heart because the Quran is a shifa for you, whether it is there to scare you and, and, and some of the words become very strong and harsh and they can draw that awe into your hearts, maybe that is the reason, but whatever it is, the Quran was revealed in Arabic and it's there the way it is for a, for a reason. Then Allah Almighty says, فَخَلَقْنَا الْعَلَقَةَ مُدْغَةً Then we turn the alaqa into a mudga, we turn it into a lump of, of meat. فَخَلَقْنَا الْمُدْغَةَ عِزَامًا Then we turn the uh, lump of meat, we uh, uh, introduce into it uh, bones. فَكَسَوْنَا الْعِزَامَ lahma. Then we dress the, the bones with, with flesh. ثُمَّ أَنْشَعْنَاهُ خَلْقًا uh, so once we have done all of this and we have dressed the, the, the human being now in the form with bones and now he's covered in flesh, well then we have created him into another being. He now becomes another soul, he now becomes another life. So glory be to Allah Almighty who is the, most, who is the greatest of all creators. Right? Here's, here's just one example. And you know, in the verses of the Qur'an, Allah Almighty uh, says uh, repeatedly, He says, if you think this is incredible, then you haven't seen anything. Right? If you think the human body and my revelation about uh, what, what's within the human body, this is nothing. You are, are really easy. You were really easy for me to create. And let, let me tell you, right? Here's, here's where science is really, really important. You want to understand the creation of Allah Almighty, right? You, you have to have some understanding of, of science around you. And if you don't have understanding of science, you have no understanding of, you, of your Lord and how He creates. Right? If you go back, you take the human back to his most basic elementary form. Where does the human start? Where does the human start? The human starts from a single strand of DNA. Right? That single strand of DNA coding that DNA coding is so incredibly complex 
that the DNA code unravels itself and it teaches itself constantly constantly really this is incredible this one and and this is not this DNA is not something that you could visibly see at, at all right but he creates uh, this incredible DNA and then he unravels the DNA and so as the uh, DNA unravels it unlocks sections within itself it unlocks instructions and it and it add piece it add pieces and it loses pieces and it constructs and all it does initially it just teaches itself how to make a protein nothing else not even a cell just a basic protein how do i become a protein this is what the dna does once the dna has got to the stage of being a protein then uh it unlocks the next part of the DNA coding. And the next part of the DNA coding teaches the protein how to add together various other elements in order for it to become a cell. And once it becomes a cell, it unlocks another DNA coding. And once it, when it unlocks a DNA, the next DNA coding, it teaches itself how to become a heart. And then when it becomes a heart, it unlocks even more DNA coding and it teaches itself how to make bones. And then one, one it becomes bones, and you know this same microscopic DNA that taught itself how to just become a protein goes on and carries all of the details of your life. It carries the details of what eye color you're going to have, or what hair color you're going to have, about how strong your muscles are going to be. In fact, it even knows that the DNA, as it keeps running, it knows for how many years it's going to keep unlocking DNA code. Because there comes a point where the DNA just eventually will just stop, will finish, and that'll mean that's the end of your story. Right? So you know all of this, if you look at it, and Allah Almighty says, but this is how I create you. How do you think I bring all of creation into existence? Right? Do you think with my hands, I, I make a planet and then I make another planet and then I blow in. No, I, I don't make things like this. I don't. You see, because he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't make one thing at a time. He didn't make your arms and then join them to your torsos. He didn't make your feet and then join them to your hips. He didn't. He put everything into a single DNA code, single DNA code, and then he said to the DNA, now you just happen, and I'm going to sit back and I'm going to watch you take place. Right? And this is, this is exactly what he does. So when he creates the universe, if he can create you, and you think about this from yourself, he can create you, you are an incredibly complex being. Right? He's given you intelligence, he's given you freedom, he has taught you much. He's got you building other things. Isn't that amazing? He's created you and then given you the ability to build other things. So he's got all of this pattern going on. But he did it all in a moment by packing in the code into one single moment right at the beginning. Right at the very beginning. So when he creates the universe... And he wants the earth to come into existence and the skies to come into existence and the sun to come in, into existence and the planets and the stars to come into existence. He doesn't work on them individually. No, not at all. Not nothing like that at all. Instead, he's got a little DNA program that's been running out there in the world. Right? It's a DNA program that's been running out there in the universe all around you. It's all around you. It is happening constantly all around you. And he has packed it in to one single moment. One single moment. And then he said, Innama amruhu idha arada shay'an an yaqula lahu kun. Right? He says, This, your Lord, this is how I work. I want to bring a whole universe into existence so that you can live. I pack every single thing into one little code right at the beginning of the world. And I say to it, kun. I say, be. That's it. My saying, be, packs in all the code that the world will ever need. Ever. That's it. Fayakun. And after that, it's happening all around you. It's happening all around you, right? 
And, and if any of you think that the world is now developed, it's not developed. It's still going. The universe is still growing. Everything is all happening all around you. And this is why he doesn't always say about himself that I am the creator of the worlds. He says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praises are for Allah Almighty for the Rabb of the universes. Rabb is the one who does tarbiyat. The one is, the, Rabb is the one who nurtures. The one who looks after. Rabb is the one who plants a seed and then watches it grow. Right? So he's still there and he's still watching all of this world taking place right in front of him. Why? Because this is the way that he works. So all of these secrets are there in the universe around you. And this is why, this is why constantly he says, إِنَّ فِي خَلْكِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ لَآيَاتٍ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَى he says, indeed, in the creation, if you want to really know your Lord, you get to know the creation around you, if you really want to. So if you, you have a look at the incredible universe all around you. Indeed, in the creation of the heavens, and indeed in the creation of the earth, and the changing of the day and the night, there is a sign for all of you. There is a sign for those people who possess the intellect and the capacity. Right? All of these signs exist for you. And these signs exist to draw you closer to your Lord Allah Almighty. This is why we study science. Because when we unlock a secret of science, it, it, it only makes us say, Subhanallah, glory be to Allah Almighty who is most perfect. Glory be to Allah Almighty who created all of these things in perfect balance. Right? And there are, there are so many, so many verses. And, and I've, I've given you an example of... Um, of the human body, it's not just the human body, it's the ecology around you, it's the plants, it's the trees, you know, all of these things. Uh, Allah Almighty in Surah Yaseen said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Subhanallah, khalaqal azwaja kullaha mimma tumbitul ard wa min anfusihim wa mimma la ya'lamoon. He said, glory be to him who creates pairs in everything. Glory be to him who creates pairs in everything from that which grows from the earth and from you amongst yourselves there are pairs and from all of those things that you're not even aware of. Right? Is this not an invitation that you should be going out there and studying ecology to try to find those pairs? Right? For so long, for so long science told us plants are not part of a pair. You know, plants generally grow up as just one single uh, specimen. It, 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 there's no male and there's no female. Up until very recently, Everybody constantly said that the, the plants are just a single species. And so you don't have a male and you don't have a female within them. It's only very, very recently, very recently that they've realized even those plants that appear to be single species actually have a male part within them, uh, a stamen, and they have a female part within them, the stigma. Right? And Allah Almighty has been saying this 1400 years ago, he said, you look, you study, why do you not study the plants? Right? Be, become a botanist, become an ecologist, go and study the plants. Go and have a look at the plants and you'll be amazed at how everything works. And for a long time, people just, people were under this impression that all you do is throw a seed into, a, into the ground and, and things will grow. And as a result, things uh, will, will continue to grow after that. That's the way things work. And Allah Almighty Years ago, 1400 years ago, Allah Almighty was talking about pollination, right? And even the verses of pollination, they're really incredible. You know, by Allah, this is a science. These are really incredible verses. In a, in a verse, Allah Almighty says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَأَرْسَلْنَا الْرِيَاحَ لَوَاقِحَ yeah, We send the pollinating winds, right? People didn't know about pollination. And Allah Almighty says, we send the, the pollinating winds. You know this word waqih, you know waqaha and waqaha, you waqihu tawqih and istawqaha. All of these, they, they use this in Arabic, idha saluba, when something becomes incredibly sticky. Right? So when something is really sticky, uh, they, they, they say waqaha or they say istawqaha. They often use it for hooves. You know when things get stuck on the hooves of, of their animals or they're, they're putting hooves onto their animals. They say that this is what we're going to do. It's, it's istawqaha. This is what we're going to do. And Allah Almighty talks about the winds that are lawaqih. 
the winds that, that strip off strip off those sticky parts. Now when you come to science, you, you realize, study plants. When you're studying science in school, study plants and study it closely and you will discover that the, the part of the plant which sits on the stigma and germinates other plants is incredibly sticky and hard to peel off. And so it's not a gentle breeze that's going to rip it off. It's not a gentle uh, wind. It's going to take some real blowing into it that's ever going to move this pollination. And so Allah Almighty, he's, 1400 years ago, he's, he's discussing this with you. He's directing you to this. And so here's this idea, you study yourselves, uh, you, you study biology, you study anatomy, you study ecology all around you, it draws you closer to Allah Almighty. This is not a matter which is separate from our deen, this is a matter which is very much uh, a part and, and fitted right within our deen. And then in exactly the same way, you look at the, the, the planets all around you. Astronomer, astronomers and astronomy. Uh, we, we heard uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf say many, many years ago that, you know, with the, the, the problem with looking up at stars, people don't understand it. People look up at stars and they say, what's this puzzling uh, reflections that you see in the sky? They're just lights all over. But you know, the truth is, if you stared at them for long enough, every single day, if you go out there and you stared at the stars, every single day and you made it your job and you made it your study slowly you will start to realize right right up there there is a star called the north star right over here there is a constellation called the orion's belt and the more you look at it the more you're able to pick out the stars and the planets all around you and he said that the, the quran is like that as well when people look at the quran they, they can't understand it because it goes from one verse to another one verse to another and and people say we can't oh it doesn't make sense it goes from this verse to this verse but that that's because you don't read it frequently enough if you read it every single day and you stared at those verses every single day by allah you will begin to see this verse is is saying this to me this verse is saying this to me but the quran the Quran doesn't speak out to people who read it once because by its own title it says most recited. So you need to be reciting it often, you need to be reciting it frequently if you're going to achieve any such thing. But if you look at the constellations and you look at the stars above your head, Allah Almighty at times, He describes things very, very simply, uh, very simplistically. So for the, the desert nomad, for the Bedouin, he gave him a maqam, he gave him some understanding of, of the stars as well. So when he says, we have, we have uh, adorned the night sky for you with beautiful lanterns. We have adorned uh, the, the lower skies for you with beautiful lanterns, with beautiful lights, so that you as the desert nomad, when you walk through the night, you're not staring up at a dark, dark sky. You're staring up at a, at a, a, a dark sky which has now been adorned with beautiful lights. Right? You like to walk under beauty. I've given you exactly that beauty. That was for, for one level of understanding. For, there was uh, something for somebody who had greater understanding. So Allah Almighty in, in the verses says, as for those people who have greater understanding than this, I've put the stars for you in place so that you may find your directions and your roots. Right? So now if you actually do stare at the stars for long enough and you know that this is my north star, if that is north star, then that must be south. And so now you're able to work out directions. And so this actually holds a level of study of astronomy for somebody who doesn't know a great deal about planets and stars, but knows enough to know that that side is the north star, therefore this must be south for me. And then there is a level where Allah Almighty talks about planets and He talks about stars. And this, this might not even be uh, something acknowledged by astronomers today, but by Allah, it's going to be, it's going to be acknowledged by them. And you know, when it is acknowledged by them, I want you to remember that you heard it from the verses of the Quran first and the astronomers after, right? Very soon, everybody's going to tell us, you know, all of these planets that have been put into place, it's as if they all exist all around us just so that the earth can exist. It's like a protection. It's like a whole web 
protecting the earth and everything on earth just so that the earth could exist. And Allah Almighty has been saying this to you in the Quran. You can't understand this, he said. You can't understand this just yet. But I've put those stars out there for you. And those stars are, uh, you know, we were talking about time travel, right? And you know, imploding stars are, are, are an example of time travel. Because when a star implodes to you, it looks like uh, it's still there, but it's disappeared. It's not there anymore, right? So it's almost stuck there in time for everybody to see. Right? But Allah Almighty says, I've put these planets and these stars up for you as a protection, as a source of protection for all of you. And so this is what your deen is giving you. It is asking you to study biology. It is asking you to study astronomy. It is asking you to study mathematics. And when we talk about our great scholars, and we talk about Imam Ahmad Radahan Bareli Rahimahullah Ta'ala, we talk about his salawat, and we talk about what he wrote. But we should also reflect on what an incredible mathematician he was. Right, really, he was an incredible mathematician. People would, from, would travel from Germany to, to India to check out their mathematical formulas with him. I, Arabs, there are stories of Arabs traveling across from Arabia to check their mathematical formulas with him. Right? So th this is who we were. This is, th our glory lies in this. And, and it's, it's just we've allowed people to separate this from us and segregate this from us and tell us, no, you, you, you just belong to Quran, you just belong to Hadith, you need not worry about all of these, let us do, let us do the sciences. No, let, us, let them not do the sciences, let's all be part of those sciences. Right? There's something that we can take and there's something that we can give. Right? There's we, Muslim contributors to science have been incredible. Right? Check, check your own histories. And it's not, it's an, I, I didn't come here to talk to you about um, the science and the Qur'an. This is science and Islam. And so you can never ever separate the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, by Allah, the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam is best for you. Whether you can understand it, whether you fail to understand it, the sunnah is best for you. Right? You be obedient to the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, you'll enjoy the best of health. Be obedient to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam, you'll enjoy the best of lives. And be obedient and you'll enjoy the best of deaths. And there's the difference. Right? People have enjoyable lives but they don't have a very good death. Right? Ya Rasulullah. Nara takbir, nara risalat, ulama ahli sunnat. तो यहां पर बराए मेहरबानी सब लोग अंदर आ जाएं और अपने नौजवान बच्चों से गुजारिश करूंगा मैं कि मेहमान बाहर खड़े हुए हैं मेहमानों का हक ज्यादा होता है यह सही है कि जगह छोटी है मगर जिन लोगों ने जिन बच्चों ने जिन नौजवानों ने यह प्रोग्राम सेटअप किया है यकीनन उनके दिल बहुत बड़े हैं तो उनके दिलों की गुंजाइश का ख्याल रखते हुए अपनी जमीन में गुंजाइश पैदा कीजिए यहां भी जगह माशाल्लाह यहां पर खाली है और अपने नौजवान बच्चों से मैं गुजारिश करूंगा कि मेहमानों को पहले जगह दें आगे तशरीफ ले आए बाहर जो मेहमान खड़े हुए हैं आगे तशरीफ ले आए जितने भी बाहर मेहमान खड़े हुए हैं उनको अंदर भेज दिया जाए हमारे नौजवान बच्चे जो यहां के मकामी हैं वो बाहर तो शिफ्ट ले जा रहे हैं जितने भी बाहर से आए हुए हैं माशाल्लाह ब्लैकबर्न प्रिस्टन मैनचेस्टर और मैं कुछ लोगों को देख रहा हूं कि वो खास तौर से इस प्रोग्राम में शरीक होने के लिए लंदन से आए माशाल्लाह उन सब लोगों को आगे आने दीजिए और जो बाहर खड़े हुए हैं वो भी वहीं 
رہ کر کے خاموشی سے پروگرام کو سماعت کرتے رہیں جی اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ ائی واز سیئنگ دیٹ بیکاز دا ٹاک ایزنٹ ایکچولی جسٹ قران اینڈ سائنس آئی آئی ڈونٹ وانٹ ٹو جسٹ گیو یو دس ائیڈیا دیٹ ایوری تھنگ وی گیٹ ایز جسٹ پیورلی آؤٹ اف دا قران ا لاٹ اف وات وی گیٹ ایز آؤٹ اف دا سننا اینڈ دیٹ دیٹ آلموسٹ ایز دیٹ آلسو ایز ایز ویری کنسسٹنٹ وت ایوری تھنگ دیٹ وی آر ٹاٹ ٹوڈے سو and and i just want to give you i, sh- I want to share with you one one example for a long long time we have an amal which is quite ajeeb to a lot of the people around us in this country that whenever we have a child who is who is born we always take a date and we chew the date and if you don't you really need to adopt this practice whenever a child is born with you because i i i'm i'm including this because i talked about the fetus and now i want to talk about when a child is born as well right so when a child is born we chew a date and you chew it until it becomes really really soft and then you take that date out of your mouth and you place it in the mouth of the child right and i'll tell you whenever we do this the nurses always used to look at us in the hospitals thinking what are these people doing right so the newborn what what is a newborn going to do with you know with, with that piece of date or that and and we we, we do this <laughs> we've been doing this whether or not we have understood it we have done it we have done it because our fathers have done it and they have done it because they said the scholars have told us to do it and the scholars said we did it because sayyidna abu musa al ashari رضی اللہ تعالی عنہ said the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did it right that's it this is the only reason why we do it fa fi sahihain ana abi musa al ashari radi allahu ta'ala anhu qal walad li ghulam he said a child a boy was born to me fa ataitu bihi an nabiy sallallahu alaihi wasallam so i bring him to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam fa sammahu ibrahim the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam names this child Uh, Ibrahim wa hanakahu bi tamratin and he does tahniq he chews a date and and once he's chewed a date he takes a very very small piece of that chewed date and he puts it into the palate of the 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 mouth of of, of the child right and th- this is an amal which is it's, it's sunnah right now this i'm telling you brothers whether or not you understand it just do it take a date when your child is born put it into the palate even if somebody's going to give you strange looks they're going to give us strange looks anyway because we hold a child up saying allahu akbar allahu akbar anyway so they're going to give us looks let them give us looks right so we take these dates we put it a story that was run in september uh on the bbc and was run again in the past couple of days i'm going to share that with you doctors are now suggesting for all newborn babies that they should run a small soft sugar gel which should be they're advising that it should be placed on the inside cheek of a child's mouth and for newborns this reduces newborn babies and for children that are born sick for them it reduces the chances of brain damage oh. right the one single thing the one single thing that is most likely to cause brain damage within a child that early is simply the lack of glucose and for so long they've been trying you know wallahi in the hospitals i've seen this they've been trying to run glucose drips they've been running du- glucose drips into these children you've seen this yourself when you ch- when your children are born premature you've seen that they put glucose drips onto them now the doctors are saying the glu- glucose drips work too slowly right it works far far too slowly for it to get around and circulate the body we are now coming back to a method which was used some some years ago which is simply place sugar into their mouth right now this is it you have the beautiful sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he couldn't tell you about premature birth people couldn't understand it in his day and age he couldn't tell you about how it might cure the sick and the diseased child so early on people wouldn't have understood it in in his age he very simply left you the most beautiful practice the practice of tahniq and he said here here is what i do here is what i want you to do right this is it's a science you know everything that he did by allah it is a science 
You know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he gets up, you know, now the doctors keep telling us, constantly telling us, you know, germs and illnesses and diseases and sicknesses. Do you know how they're passed? What part of your body passes these, all of these illnesses? It's your hands. Right? They keep telling you, it's your hands. Which is why every time you go into a hospital, they tell you, wash your hands in the alcohol uh, rubs before you go in to see the sick. Because if, if there's anything on your body that is going to carry illnesses and diseases and impurities and filth, it is your hands. Make sure. Right? You follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Right? And he ﷺ says that when I get up in the morning, and this is, this is what he left for you as a practice. He said, when I get up in the morning, I do not insert my hands into the dish from which I am going to do wudu. Right? He said, I never ever insert my hands into the dish. I always pour water from the dish onto my hands and I wash my hands outside. Right? This is my starting point. Once I've done it outside, then I do the rest of my wudu from within the dish. Right? He couldn't explain to you why the necessity... He very simply said, you don't know where your hands spend the night. That's what he said to the people. He said, you should always wash your hands outside because you don't know where your hands spend the night. Right? For, for, the, for the Arabs and for the people of his time, this was it. This was perfect because he left them a beautiful practice. And so for everything that he did, for everything that the Quran commands us, that, that we are dictated, obey it, follow it, pursue the knowledge. Go, we, we need, we need astronomers again. We need historians again. We need doctors again. Because all of that, all of that knowledge is what makes a civilization powerful. You know, our, our golden era uh, was the days when, uh, the, the, when, when the kings and the sultans would pay out people uh, gold in the weight of the book that they had translated. So they, you know, whenever people translated books, they didn't pick up a pamphlet, right? Nobody wants a pamphlet. They found the thickest book they possibly could. They, they got the thickest book, they translated it, and they bring it to the sultans and say, here you go, weigh up that one then. Right? But we enjoyed, this became our golden era. You know, this became us, the Muslim successful. This became the, the Muslim scientists. You know, everything that they have in this country, this is, it, it's, it's our history, really. You know, they have universities here and they have university hospitals here. This is really, it, it, it's a Muslim idea. Muslims in Iraq, Muslim doctors in Iraq actually had this idea that we'll have a university hospital, right? And they say, bring us all those patients that nobody can cure. And when those patients were brought to them, these doctors in Iraq said, we'll give you a bed, we'll give you food, we'll give you whatever you want. Just let us try to, uh, let us test different medicines on you to see if we can cure you. Right? Because y you're not going to get cured anywhere else. You might as well stay with us and we're going to, tr we'll try our very, very best. Right? It was university hospitals. That's, that's who we are. We are the people of university hospitals. It's just we have forgotten that part of our history. I think it's really crucial that we reclaim that part uh, of, of our joy. We reclaim that part of our knowledge. But we do not do it independently. Don't just become just solely doctors. Don't become just solely astronomers. It comes back to what the Prophet ﷺ uh, said. He said, Kuna aliman aw mutaaliman. He said, be either a scholar yourself. Uh, or, or be a student or, or kun muhibban or he said be somebody who listens to the scholars or, or sami'an or somebody who uh, no somebody who loves the scholars or be somebody who listens to the scholars and do not be the fifth for you will be destroyed so study all of those knowledges all of those areas whilst keeping good company with the ulama Allah Almighty will restore us our glory we no longer live in a time I'm, I'm going to finish with this we no longer live in a time where you can pick up swords and you can say, we are mighty, we are strong. Because there can be a hundred thousand of you standing in one place and one person on the other and that one could be enough to kill all of you. Right? Because he's sitting in a tank. Your swords are pretty useless against him. Right? It's time that you develop. And this is where we Muslims have stopped. We have stopped developing. Uh, we have not kept up with the study all around us. And all of this 
as a result of people telling us, no, 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 your knowledge is, they're not the same. Leave the sciences and development to us. You just stick to your Quran and Hadith. And Allah Almighty wasn't the one to allow this to be separated. He came to join all of this together. And you combine this with good akhlaq, and the Prophet wasallam said, I've come here to complete and perfect your etiquettes and your akhlaq. You combine all of this, and you will suddenly realize our whole point, as, as we heard earlier, our, our whole point of existence, our, and our study of the sciences, and our studies of the Quran, and our studies of the Hadith, all of this is all in place to elevate us as humans and get us closer to our Lord. So one day, the same Lord who said to us, you're not good enough for my paradise, so leave here, one day will say, you have achieved such a status again that I want to readmit you all into paradise. And you know, the first of the people, the first of the people are going to be the followers of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said that. He said, me and the poor people, we are going to be the first into paradise. May Allah make us all those poor people that he talks about. And may Allah Almighty grant us his company. May Allah Almighty grant us his vision. May Allah Almighty enter us all. And may, may we sit packed in paradise tomorrow like we sit packed in this mosque today. <laughs> Subhanallah.